Session at this time, Brother Carter, you come. Make sure, oh, I am on, I'm on, okay. Ephesians 6, and we'll just pick up where we kind of left off there, if you will. Um, it says in verse number 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That's every parent's life verse. <laughs> Honor thy father and thy mother, and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And young people, I want to explain the scriptures in a way that you can understand it. If you don't obey and honor your mother, she will kill you. <laughs> and that's why that verse is in there. So they, she, you think she's kidding when she says, says things like, I will kill you and make another one just like you. But she's not kidding, really. Anyway. And, and then for some reason, I don't know why, for some reason it says, and ye fathers. <laughs> Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address this issue of training within the home. We're going, to, we're going to build from where we've been because there's a direct link here through Scripture, but this application is not exclusively limited to, um, limited to, did I turn this off instead of off? There we go. Okay. We're good. I had the microphone off for some reason. Um, this application is not limited to dealing with anger in the home, but it certainly does apply because we are... We are training our children by our behavior, okay? And that's what he's speaking of here. Provoke not your children to wrath. You don't have to sit your kids down and say, no, listen, honey, I want you to pay attention right now because daddy's going to teach you how to be angry. First, you tighten your neck. Squint with your, tell you, get a vein coming out right here, right? You don't have to do that, do you? You teach them by example. You teach them by the presence of anger in your home. And by such, by using anger in the home, you're provoking them to then respond in anger. They are, they are learning how to do so. And, and then we get upset with them. Hey, don't you take that attitude with me. But what you've taught them by using anger in the home is that anger solves problems. And that's, by the way, one of the big deceptions of anger, isn't it? It seems like when you get angry, it fixes the problem. But that is a lie. It may satiate the immediate circumstance, but it does not fix the problem. It actually only multiplies problems. And so it has to be dealt with in a proper and biblical way. And you have to remove the lies that Satan has used to deceive you. You know, Satan works in four primary ways. And the first is deception. He is a deceiver. He's a liar from the beginning. And, and we have to eliminate those lies that we have believed. And we have to put our, the word of God in, the, in that proper place. We have to, as I said earlier, come to faith that God is true and everything else is a lie. If God says it, it is true, no matter how you feel about it, no matter what you think about it, no matter what you were learnt, taught, and, and no matter where you were taught, by the way. I've, I've heard things even taught in, in church that sound good, but when I compare it to Scripture, and there are a lot of people in churches like that, aren't there? They're being taught something but it's not according to the word of God. And so always, and, and I say this, and I know your pastors all agree with this too, anything that you hear from a pulpit, you compare to this. This is what's right, okay? Men are fallible. Men are fallible. But the Bible is infallible. And it is true, always, okay? So he says, don't provoke your children to wrath, but instead bring them up in the nurture an admonition of the Lord. The word nurture means that which promotes growth. And then, of course, education, or admonition, I'm sorry, is the education and or instruction. Education and instruction. Now, in the 
Old Testament, God gives us a pattern for this, and it's a very important pattern, and we're going to look at this pattern, and then we're going to look at an application from Scripture, okay? So go back to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Deuteronomy 6. And this portion of Scriptures is often, it's referred to as the Shema, okay? And that is, this is the portion of Scripture that every Jewish child has to memorize, and it is a very important portion of passage for them in their homes, in their culture. And, and uh, it, it, it's, um, it's a portion that would have been um, memorized by Jewish kids from, from the very beginning. And it starts there, we'll start in verse number three there. It says, uh, hear therefore, O Israel, and notice this statement, observe to do it, right? Hear so you can do, right? There's a, there's a connection there, isn't there? Uh, be, not, be not forgetful hearers, but doers of the word, the Bible says. So here to do, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. So here's the, the promises of God. And, and I, I would submit to you that the idea of the land that floweth with milk and honey isn't about prosperity, it's about faith. Um, it's an interesting connection here. And I, this is off topic, but anyway, it's still, I already said it, so I've got to go, I've got to go down the rabbit trail now. Um, it's, uh, um, milk and honey occur in pasture lands, not, not grain lands. And Israel was coming out of a agricultural environment in Egypt where there were bountiful amounts of grain and sustenance in that fashion, farming and so forth. And they were going into a land that was pastoral and would require them to depend upon God completely by faith because the Egyptians depend, depended on the river and the sun. That's why they worshiped those things, by the way. And that's why in in Israel, the primary god that the Canaanites worshipped was Baal, which was the storm god, they would say. And uh, he brought the rain, and then rain was necessary for the, for the grass and so forth to grow on the hillsides and the mountainsides there in the central uh, mountain ridge of Israel, where Israel was going to primarily be. So mostly what they had was, was uh, pastures, and that's why Abraham was a herdsman, and Jacob was a herdsman, and Isaac was a herdsman, and so forth, because that was what was there. Uh, and so this is a land flowing with milk and honey, it doesn't mean absolute full abundance. Sometimes we hear it presented that way, uh, but really what it means is a land that you're going to have to trust God in because you're going to have to depend on God. That's why they, that's why they were, you know, so many times you read in the, in the Old Testament about the, the droughts. Why was that so important? Because that was the type of land they were in. And they were completely dependent on God sending rain, and that's why rain in the Old Testament is so connected to blessings, right? And why God said, when you're right with me, I'll send it. You have to trust me, you have to walk with me, and I'll provide and take care of you. But anyway, that's a whole nother topic. I don't know why in the world I got off on that. Verse number four. Hear, O Israel, the, word, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. By the way, when Jesus said, what, when they said, what is the first and great commandment? We often think about the Ten Commandments when we hear that statement. You say, well, Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy might. Um, and uh, that would be how we perceive the first commandment um, is, is actually, you know, thou shalt have no other gods before me, right? Uh, in the Ten Commandments. But when, what Jesus quoted was this. This is what he quoted. And for the Jewish people, they, they perceive this. Matter of fact, um, if you ever, not that I'm recommending this, but like Dennis Prager um, did this whole thing on a Jewish perspective of the Ten Commandments. This is what he says is the first commandment. For, this is what they teach their children is the first commandment. Okay, this verse. Verse 6. He says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Notice the personal thy statement here. Remember um, T pronouns in the Bible are singular and Y pronouns are plural. So T pronouns contain a directed intention. They are to the individual, okay? Not to the group. Now, 
thine heart. You're responsible to put them there. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates. Now, notice here the personal nature of this statement but then also notice the constant use of the word these and them and, and uh, this they this, these words here are all speaking of what? They're speaking of the commandments but they're not speaking of the commandments in simply a, a um, you know passive practical belief system right? As if they were not present regularly everywhere we are because notice the context of what he says he says, not only should they be in your heart, thy heart, in verse number 6, but he says, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. The word diligently means with steady application and care, with industry, not carelessly, not negligently. Intentional teaching and training. How is that supposed to work? Notice what he says. Talk of them. When thou sittest in thine house, it ought to be the conversation when you're sitting around the house. That's what he says. And uh, by the way, if you're not sitting in the house and you're out walking around, talk about them then too. So you should only talk about God's commandments if you're sitting in the house or you're not in the house. And those are the two places you should talk about them. That's what it says, right? Oh, and also when you lie down and then when you rise up. So only if you're sitting or walking or laying or standing should you talk about the commandments. That's, that is what he says. He says it should be so much that you talk about the commandments of God with your family and you discuss it. Not, listen, not just saying, you better obey the commandments, you better do what's right, but rather discussing the commandments with your children, discussing them with your family. Hey guys, what do you think it means when the Bible says you shouldn't lie? Let's talk about different things that we might be tempted to lie about. And let's talk about ways in which people, uh, maybe, maybe ways that people lie. And, and we're talking about the commandments. We're discussing and we're, we're in, investigating them together. We're thinking about them together and having this ongoing discussion about the application. Because remember what he said back there in verse number three. Here, so you might observe to do. So we're discussing how to live according to the commandments of God. And remember what I said here a few nights ago, that when we understand verse number 5 here, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and we approach the commandments from love, they all become opportunities. And that's how you teach your children to love the commandments of God and to love God. These are opportunities for us to demonstrate our love for God. Let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. Let's talk about it everywhere. What do your kids love? <coughs> well, my kids love baseball. Why? Because you talk about it. You watch it when you're sitting in your house and you talk about it sitting there and then you talk about it when you're walking around. They love football, they love basketball, they love fill in the blank. Why? Because it's what they focus on. It's what they communicate with you about. And it becomes the object of their affection because it's always before their eyes. And that's what he says in the next thing, in the next verse there. Verse 8, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. Everything you do with your hands ought to reflect that conversation they shall be frontless between thine eyes. It ought to be the focus of your attention. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. When you come into your home, it ought to be the thing you're remembering. And when you leave your home, it ought to be the thing you're remembering. Everywhere in your life, it should be focused on the commandments of God. Now, you say, man, pastor, I mean, does, that doesn't leave much room for anything else. Okay, so you did understand. Yeah, it should be the focus of our life. These words, these commandments. Now, 
The Bible uses this, um, these words. It uses the word transgression for sin. We know what transgression is. It's the commission of sin. And it uses the word iniquity. And sin is kind of like an overarching word that incorporates or includes both of these items, right? Transgression and iniquity. So iniquity, that's an interesting word. Um, if we were to define, most would say iniquity is an inward, inward sin, right? Um, he was wounded for our transgression, outward he was bruised for our iniquity, that's inward. And it, it makes sense to say that, but then how do, I, how, do I rec- how do I reconcile what that really means And so I'm going to give you a very simple, practical, working definition for iniquity that I think will really help clarify this, okay? Iniquity is any attitude towards sin that is positive or negative toward God. So if I have a positive attitude towards sin, I'm going to speak about it in a positive way. I'm going to think about it in a positive way. And my thinking, my thinking and my speech will lead to my activities, which will then be passed down to my children. Remember Ephesians, provoke not your children to wrath. And so I'm training my children and I'm passing down. The Bible does not talk about generational sin. It uses the term iniquity, visiting the iniquities of the fathers unto the children of the third and fourth generation. That is not a genetic visitation. If it were genetic, then why would it stop after three or four generations? What it is, is an attitude and thinking pattern that we teach our children, and our children learn and teach their children And somewhere down the line, this is what happens. Someone might say, boy, my grandpa, he was an alcoholic. He was a, he was a this, he was a that. And man, my dad struggled with that. But I was like, I am not, that is not going to be me. And they broke that line, okay? Because they've seen the devastation. And that's iniquity being passed down. So what happens is when you sit in your home, and you and something comes up about a sinful thing. Maybe it's maybe it's rock and roll music, and you say, "Well, I don't listen to that rock and roll anymore." But you know, I came out of the world, and I, I got saved out of that. And your kids say something like, "Dad, did did you ever go to any like rock concerts or anything like that?" And you're like, "Oh man, yeah, I went to this one concert. Oh my goodness, it was in, it was so crazy. I mean, this and this and this." And, and what happens is they hear the tone in your voice. And kind of the glint in your eye as you're recounting this thing that you had done. And in their mind, they're saying, they're saying, wow, it seems like that that dad really had a lot of fun doing that. It seems like he really enjoyed doing that. And then you counter all that by just saying, but you know, it's not right to listen to rock music. We learned that at church, you know. But what they hear is the positive. And then you get up on Sunday morning and you're like, Come on, kids, get together. Come on, you know you're supposed to be ready by now. We have to go to church. And they hear negative. They are positive towards sin, negative toward God. Yeah, I used to love to listen to rock and roll music and and smoke and cuss and all that, but, but I can't anymore because the pastor said it's sinful and I don't do that now. And you're passing on iniquity. Your demonstration of anger passes on the iniquity of anger, your demonstration in other areas. And what happens, and this is why this is so important, because iniquitous thinking leads to transgressive action. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so a parent will look at a child and they'll say, I don't understand, Pastor, I don't know what happened. I mean, I taught them everything I was supposed to teach them. I had them in church every time we were here. I told them what they were doing was wrong and they're out there doing it. But somewhere along the line, by the way, let me not excuse a child, a young person's self-will. Every sin you commit is your choice. It's you. It's not your parents. But yet at the same time, parents, let us not ignore the fact 
that so often we do pass on wrong thinking patterns to our children that lead to the transgressions that they end up getting involved in. And we both have to take responsibility for that, don't we? I know it's primarily your wife's fault, but still, you married her, so it's your fault too. These wrong thinking patterns. So what do we do? How do we correct that? Well, first of all, we have to correct our conversation and our own heart. You can't teach your children to love God if you do not love him supremely. So you have to get that right in you. Secondly, we have to make our conversation appropriately about the things of God in everything that we discuss. Everything that we talk about ought to come back to, what does the Bible say about that? How does God feel about that? How should we correct ourselves in regard to that? And that conversation is an ongoing conversation everywhere we are. You do yourself great harm, great harm, when you act one way here at church and you go home and it's completely different. When, when you're here in town, you keep all the rules because you don't want anyone to think bad about you, but you go on vacation and you throw them all out. Your inconsistency is what's producing your problem. Inconsistency produces rebellion. By the way, you don't even have to have the most stringent rules of everyone in the church in order to have kids turn out right. You just need to have consistent application of the rules you have. And I know that as independent Baptists, we love rules. We love rules. Sometimes people think this, but you know, sometimes people think the pastor must lay at home at night just thinking about what more rules he can put in place. Like that's all he thinks about, right? It's not. It's not. He thinks about why is everyone breaking the few rules that we actually have? I don't understand that. No, I'm just well, maybe I don't know. Anyway. It's not about how many rules you have or how strict your rules are. It's about how consistent you are in your life with the rule. When there's inconsistency, it produces rebellion. So we have, to, we have to get our heart right, our love for God right. We have to make our, our conversation proper about the things of God, and we have to be consistent in it. Now, go with me over to Proverbs chapter number 22, because here's the verse actually that most people think about when we talk about training children and, and moving forward. And so we, we see in Ephesians, he says, provoke them not to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so we see in, in Deuteronomy a process here by which we, uh, by which we do that. In, in, Ephes- I mean, sorry, in Proverbs 22, this is a very often misread and misapplied verse. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This verse does not mean, as some would imply, If you teach them, they may go wrong for a while, but they will always come back and do right in the end. That's not what this says, right? And I'm going to, I don't know, I'm going to say something that I think is is just, it's just a truth, and, and it's not how we often think about this, because I've heard so many people think or talk about this verse in so many different ways, and, and, um, and they will, will ask questions, and I get asked this question a lot. Is that verse a promise? And the answer is, No, it's not a promise. And it's also not a principle. Well, I thought it was a principle, Pastor. If it's not a promise, it has to be a principle. No, it's not a principle. It's a proverb. You know how I know? Because at the top of the page it says, proverb. What is that supposed to mean? A proverb is something that is true generally, but there can be exceptions. In other words, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old he won't depart from it, is a general truth. How you train your children is what they will become like. We don't like to think about the fact that our training has been wrong many times, and and um, what, what they became is what we trained them to do? Because we counter that with, but I told them. And we need to come to the realization that telling is not training. 
training is something specific. So what is training? All right. We, we don't have time to get into the full dissertation of this today for, for the sake of time. But if you look at the Gospel of Mark, what you find is Jesus, the servant, training the disciples, right? And we know, I understand, he was training them in all the Gospels. But in Mark in particular, it's very much focused on the training process. And there's a, there's a pattern that takes place in Mark. And the pattern is this. He'll ask him a question, and then he'll teach. He'll instruct about something. And Jesus' instruction um, in the Gospels is often um, interrogatory, um, inter interlocutor, and, and essentially asking questions and communicating back and forth, as opposed to lecture format, which often we do. But he did both, didn't he? He, he preached and gave lecture, and then, and then he asked questions and interacted in that fashion. So he would ask a question and he would instruct them about something. He'd, he'd teach them about something. And then he would give them something to do. He'd say, all right, now I want you guys to go. I want you to go out to these towns and I want you to preach. Or I want you guys to feed these folks, right? Or I want you to, you know, get in the boat and go across the lake. Okay, so he's given them some instruction. And during that time of an uh, of, demonst uh, of uh, demonstration, he, he would demonstrate. He would he would you know feed the th five thousand, or he would he would uh, heal the blind, or or you know something, and, and then he would give them this this task, and and they would go to do it. And often, what we read is he would then re resort up to a mountain, and and he would see them, and he's watching them, right? And then what happens is that he comes down and he rescues them from their from their situation and or they get done and they come back and he corrects them right and he'll correct them and he'll say you have little faith right um and, and these type of corrections okay so this is a pattern it actually goes on six full rotations in the gospel of mark and then it starts into the seventh where there is a withdraw and an observance and that happens when christ is is done and he has withdrawn and he is now observing. He's given them a task and he's now watching. And he's going to come back and we're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ and correction. So it'll be a full seven rotations. It's interesting. But think about these patterns here. Think about training. Because that's what Jesus was doing. He was training the disciples. So when we train, we first instruct. There's instruction. Then there's demonstration. Then there's participation. We give them something to do. Then there's observation. And then there's correction. Five primary steps of training. Okay. The problem for most parents is they want to jump from telling, not instructing, by the way. Telling is different than instructing. Telling to corporal punishment. It's like we're going, whoom, right? And there's no training in the middle of that. And discipline should never take place until training is properly completed. Discipline is for rebellion. But if a person is untrained, so how do we do this? All right? practical example. Kids, we're going to learn how to clean our room. Okay, let's go in the room. Let's look around at the room. Now I notice that you have your toys all around the room. For a room to be clean, all the toys need to be in the toy box. And I notice your clothes are laying all over. For a room to be clean, the clothes, this may be helpful for some of the college students here, the, the clothes <laughs> need to be in the hamper. Okay, and I notice your shoes. There's one over there, and there's one over there, and for some reason there's one on top of the bookshelf. For the room to be clean, all your shoes need to be lined up side by side in the closet. right? And then I notice there's trash and candy wrappers. For some reason, a lot of candy wrappers under your bed. For a room to be clean, we have to take all that trash and throw it away. Now, a clean room, kids never has random stuff 
shoved under the bed or in the closet. This is instruction. I'm telling them what cleaning a room entails, what it looks like, and what we need to watch for. Now then, kids, I want you to watch because I'm going to show you how to do these things. Look at this. I'm going to pick up all your clothes and I'm going to put them in the hamper just like this. And I'm going to pick up all your toys. I'm going to put them in the toy box right over here. No, 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 don't, don't go. It's not time to play. It's time for you to learn. I'm, I want you to watch me. I'm showing you how to do it. We're going to pick up all these candy wrappers. We're going to put them in your trash can. We're going to put your shoes in the closet. We're going to clean out. I don't even know where this stuff came from under your bed. And we're going to pull it. Let's put it up. Let's put it in its proper place. And they watch you do it. This is... Step number two of training. This is what the disciples did with Jesus. And then you say, okay, we're going to make sure we clean our room every day. So we keep it clean. So tomorrow, we're going to take some time and we're going to do it together. So tomorrow you come in and you're reminded of that passage where Jesus said, you know, the, about the, the demon that was cast out of the man, and, and then it came back, and it was seven times worse. And that's what happens to the room by tomorrow, you know. <laughs> you go, I mean, I cleaned this yesterday, but it's okay. We're training. We're training. Now let's do it together. What's the first thing we do? I think we're supposed to put the clothes in the hamper. All right, let's do it. Come on, you do it with me this time. We pick them up and we put it in the hamper. All right, what's next? Um, I don't know. Well, no, you know, we, we did this yesterday. What was it? What do we do next? Well, uh, I guess the toy's got to be put up. Yep, let's do it together. And we work through this and we're doing it together. Notice we instruct and then we demonstrate and then we participate. They are doing it with us. Now then, we may do that for several days or several weeks. And we come to a point where they're getting it. We see it. They're getting it. And now we say, all right, I tell you what, today you're going to clean your room and I'm just going to watch it. I'm going to watch you do it. And they start doing it and they get done and they think they're done and there's something they have left undone. Correction. All right, not discipline yet. Correction, hey, remember we're supposed to also put this up. Okay, you forgot that, so let's take care of that. So the next day we come back and we do it again, and we do it again. And we're observing until there is no more need for correction. At some point in that correction process, we may need to step back to instruction again. Because somewhere they didn't understand something. And we may go through that in that area again just to train. Once I as a parent can observe them having do, done what I have taught them to do, trained them to do, and they do it without error several times, now I know they are trained. Now when I say, please go clean your room, I know they know what that means. The training process is important. And too often we subvert it. We just make assumptions. I've cleaned their room before, so they ought to know what a clean room is. And we don't take time to instruct and demonstrate and participate and observe and correct so that they're properly trained. Imagine, just as an adult, imagine you get a new job at some, some metal factory and you walk in for your first day on the job and the, the supervisor greets you at the door and says, uh, okay, now listen, um, I'm going to put you on the extrusion press over here and uh, you just go over and run that press, okay? And you say, uh, I don't even know what that means. Um... What, what am I supposed to do? He says, hey, hey, we hired you to do a job, okay? Get over there and get it done. That's how your kids feel. 
say, come on, pastor, cleaning the room is not that difficult. Well, sure, it's not now because you're an adult. And you know what you want done. But they don't. They're children. They need training. They need training. And that training process is something that you should not shortcut. Now, you say, well, when does discipline come into it? Because I don't want to eliminate all discipline. I really enjoy that part. Discipline comes in when training has been thoroughly done and a child is in rebellion. I know I trained you how to do this. Remember that six months we took? It doesn't generally take that long, actually. But you're not doing it. Now let's sit down and reason together, right? And if there's rebellion, we have some intense fellowship. Why? Because the problem is not training. The problem is rebellion. And the Bible gives a remedy for rebellion. Okay. But often what we interpret as rebellion is actually our poor instruction. We have to take responsibility for that. And then we get angry because they're not responding like we say. And we, we're training them even worse and more and more bad things. It's important that we get that correction done in us. And, and listen, um, as the parent... We are setting the standard of how to respond to life for our children. See, life isn't just about the things that we do. It's about the way we approach them. It's not just about cleaning a room. It's about the attitude that we have when we do a task. And if our children are picking up this idea that, man, this stuff is always just bad and horrible and we hate it, but we have to do it, we have no choice, and, 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 and we just do the sloppiest job we can just to get by, please accept some responsibility for that as their trainer. Because it's probable that somewhere in your life, that's how you're responding. This is a necessity for us to correct. We have to come to the place where we train properly. The word train means to discipline by teaching, to bring to a desired state by means of instruction. The word train translated here in Proverbs 22 is translated four other times in the Bible as dedicate. And just once as train up. Training, dedicating to a task, teaching them, instructing them. Now go back to chapter number 6 of, uh, of Ephesians there. Fathers, verse number 4, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. Bring them up. Train them, we could say, in what? The nurture and admonition of the Lord. You ever hear someone say, ma'am, raising kids is tough. Wouldn't it be good if there was a manual or something? Hmm. There is. There is. There's direct instruction about it, as a matter of fact. The hardest part about raising children is not, is not um, the discipline side of things. The hardest part about raising children is the discipline that, that needs to take place here. You'll spend 10 times more effort in discipline and be frustrated. And you tell yourself this lie, I don't have time to train them. That's a lie. Proper training generally eliminates the necessity of most discipline. But you have to invest the time up front. So you'll either invest the time up front to train properly, 
or you'll spend 10 times more trying to correct improperly. Train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And if you train them up properly, they'll have the character to continue on. Now, you say, well, what if they make bad decisions? Well, they're likely to, just like you did. Amen. And they'll answer to God for their bad decisions. But I'm telling you, that training process is generally where our downfall in raising children happens.